Dr. Jaffe is honored as the International Scientist of, 19, of, of 2003 by the IBC in Oxford, England for his lifetime contributions to clinical medicine, biochemistry, immunology, methodology, and integrative health policy. He currently serves on the American Board of Clinical Metal Toxicology and coordinates its certification training program. He is an author of over 100 uh, scientific articles. He has presented to this academy once before, and it's an honor to have him back. So please give him a warm IAOMT welcome. It is a pleasure to be back. It's a particular pleasure to follow Professor Skexel. Uh, Vera has done some outstanding work. And while I won't be talking about immunology today, I hope at another time, uh, if there is interest, that uh, perhaps she and I could do a workshop on the immunology of toxic metals. But what we're here to share today uh, is a different aspect of our work, uh, having to do with an old friend ascorbate and what is the evidence that it can remove toxic metals. Is it an antioxidant or a pro-oxidant? Where, when, so what? What does it matter? My background, as you know, is conventional medicine. I am a certified clinical nutritionist and have to go back to Baltimore because of the uh, a double scheduling this weekend uh, tonight. I am senior fellow of the Health Studies Collegium, where our research gets done, director of ELISAC Biotechnologies, the lymphocyte response assay that I direct, and PERC, the nutritional company that I direct. Uh, I will not today be talking about any products from the rostrum. The disclaimer says that I do or do not have any financial interests of a product in my talk or with any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. Whatever that is, the disclaimer I agree with. Thank you. So does a scorbate complex, does it connect with does it chaperone? Does it mobilize? Does it safely excrete toxic minerals? And what's the interaction with other therapies? Where does ascorbate act and function? Is ascorbate an antioxidant or a prooxidant? Now, if you're having trouble seeing prooxidant on this slide, it's because in biological terms, ascorbate is never a prooxidant. So if you want to kind of drift through the rest of the talk, the headline is that ascorbate in biological systems is always an antioxidant, never a prooxidant. We'll get to the details in a moment, but you can take that in if you will. What we're going to look at together is whether we can complex, mobilize, and safely excrete the toxic metals, other biological detoxification therapies, and then pulsed D-penicillamine uh, and how it can add to the safe and effective removal of toxic metals when used along with ascorbate and other biological response modifiers. So, <clears throat> um, I, I developed this presentation and sent the slides off to Rich Fisher, who was nice enough to send back the feedback that there was some good information here, and I hope you'll find that to be true. But how was I going to get through it all in an hour? And the answer was, I took out half the slides. Because I either had to talk twice as fast, which if you know how fast I normally talk, you wouldn't want me to talk twice as fast. Um, or I could give you the important slides, which I will, and lay, leave in the presentation. So if you go to the IAOMT website or you go to the PERC website, you're able to download the entire presentation, the entire PowerPoint with all the slides. I'll be showing the ones that are germane to this presentation, but there's a lot of evidence in support, collateral information in support, that's in the full PowerPoint presentation uh, and I do want you to know that that exists on the IAOMT website for download, as well as the perk.com website for download. So let's get back to our main subject, ascorbate. We're talking about buffered vitamin C. We're not talking about ascorbic acid. When we say ascorbate, we always mean the buffered form of vitamin C. This is bioidentical to what you find in food, in case anybody wants to know whether we're talking about the bioequivalent and bioidentical forms, we are. And why is vitamin C so interesting? This is the structure of vitamin C for those of you who are chemically oriented. Well, what's really interesting about ascorbate chemically is that it has vicinal hydroxyls. Now, there's only going to be a few minutes of chemistry. But what that means is that you have two hydroxyls on the same side of adjacent carbons. So this hydroxyl and that hydroxyl are either coming out towards us or pushed in away from us, but they're on the same side of the carbon. What that means is 
that there's a strain. This increases the strain on the chemical bond and it greatly lowers the beneficial oxidation reduction potential. What that means in English is that ascorbate can act as a reducing substance more effectively than anything else in biological systems and it can reduce other oxidative toxins or chaperone oxidative toxins like toxic metals out of the body if you use it properly. Now we'll talk for a few minutes about how to use it properly. I'm going to leave up the chemistry, but I'm not going to get into vicinal hydroxyls and all that jazz. But in terms of removal of toxic metals, if you look at the literature, and it is hard to find, but it is there, apparently ascorbate is more effective at removing lead, then mercury, then arsenic, then cadmium, nickel, beryllium, calcium, copper, magnesium, and zinc. So all minerals, all minerals can have their excretion increased by ascorbate. And if you're taking ascorbate for the purpose of mobilizing toxic metals and removing them from the body, you might want to use a form of ascorbate that is beneficially buffered with potassium, calcium, magnesium, and zinc, the four principal minerals that the body needs to buffer. And you would want to bring those into the body, either through the ascorbate or through other supplementation or through diet, at the same time that you're taking therapeutic amounts of ascorbate to remove toxic metals. Because while you will remove the toxic metals, you will also increase the excretion of other minerals. That's why we use the buffered form of ascorbate, and that's why we want to alkalinize people by taking in more buffering foods and buffering mineral supplements to keep the body alkalinized. If you look at the Journal of Experimental Biology 2002, that was a very important article that reinforces this message. Now, the question is how much ascorbate does it take to excrete how much toxic metal? And now I'm going to go through some math. Not very much and not very long, but a little bit of math. If we take a gram of ascorbate, a thousand milligrams is a gram of ascorbate. Many people take a half or one gram a day. So let's say we're talking about people who take a thousand milligrams of ascorbate. That turns out to be five millimoles if you do the math. So a gram of ascorbate, which is a thousand milligrams, is also a million micrograms. That's just simple math. A gram is a thousand times a milligram. A milligram is a thousand times a microgram. So you've got a million micrograms in a gram of ascorbate. And about 0.01% binds toxic minerals. Toxamine here is any toxic mineral. So 1,000 micrograms of ascorbate binds about 0.1 micromoles of lead at 207.2 molecular weight. That's about 20.7 micrograms of lead can be mobilized by one gram of ascorbate in a day. That's the math. So if you take one gram of ascorbate and you have extra lead in the body, you could remove about 20 micrograms of lead in the day if you took a gram of ascorbate. What's the endogenous turnover in the average American in regard to lead and mercury each day? Does anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Nobody knows the definitive answer. This is partly a rhetorical question, because if any of you know the answer, tell me. But the answer, the answer is about 10 to 20 micrograms a day. You can, there are some very healthy people that, appre, that appear to excrete much less. They seem to take in and excrete much less. There are people who excrete more. But the average North American appears to have a turnover of about 10 to 20 micrograms a day of heavy metals. And that's in the mix of lead and arsenic and cadmium and nickel and mercury. If we look for a moment at mercury, and we do the same math. So we're looking at mercury. We're looking at mercury's ability to bind to these vicinal hydroxyls of the ascorbate. Same math. You have five millimoles in a gram. You have a million micrograms in a gram. 0.1% binds the toxic minerals. That translates to 20 micrograms of mercury per gram of ascorbate. If I translate that into common parlance, those people who take about a gram of ascorbate a day are able to maintain their normal turnover without damage. But you haven't gotten into mobilizing and excreting. You're just dealing with the endogenous turnover and what you have by birthright of breathing and drinking and eating in modern 21st century America. 
So more than a gram a day will be needed if we want to mobilize body burdens. The first thousand milligrams you take each day probably just neutralizes the turnover of that day. So if we look at all the toxic metals based on their molecular weights, 20 micrograms of lead or mercury, 7.5 of arsenic, 11.2 of cadmium, 5.9 of, of nickel would come out on a molar basis for every gram of ascorbate. If anybody wants, I can go through the math with you another time. But the takeaway is that about 10 micrograms of toxic minerals will be safely mobilized and eliminated from the body for each gram of ascorbate you take in. So at a minimum, ascorbate has a role in protecting the daily turnover of toxic metals. And if you take about 1,000 milligrams or one gram, you should be able to protect about 10 micrograms and excrete that safely from the body. So what then <coughs> is daily toxic mineral exposure? That's about 20 micrograms a day. So the first two grams of ascorbate you take in the day will safely protect and help excrete toxic metals. But remember, we're still dealing with the normal turnover. We haven't yet gotten to the tissues and cleaning them out. So let's move forward and say, what would we do if we knew that the first two grams per day safely protect and excrete typical daily exposure? What would we do if we wanted to safely mobilize and increase the excretion of toxic metals through ascorbate and other synergies? Well, now we have to get into half-life. That gets even more complicated than chemistry. Half-life is the consumption rate. When people say to me, how much vitamin C should I take? I look back at them and I say, how much vitamin C do you need? And they look back at me and say, but I asked you. And I look back at them and I say, what's your half-life? And that shortens the conversation. <laughs> but then I explain that if you're using up the vitamin C so that half of it goes away in 30 minutes, or you're using up the vitamin C so that half of it goes away in 30 days, the amount you'll need to achieve the same tissue level is vastly different if your half-life is 30 days or your half-life is 30 minutes. Roger Williams, in his book, Biochemical Individuality, Your Beautiful World Within, pointed out that ascorbate has the widest range of need of any essential substance in nature. You need, sometimes people need a little bit, a couple of hundred milligrams a day, maybe a thousand or two thousand milligrams a day, and sometimes people need a lot. And we're gonna get in a moment into the question of who needs how much and why. One of the things it comes back to is, half-life or consumption rate to achieve the same cell plasma level. Now, do you understand that if you lose half of your ascorbate in 30 minutes, that's different than losing half of it in 30 days? And wherever you lost it, you should go find it. That was from my grandmother. <laughs> now, some people need little. These are the really healthy people. So we took a group and I'll show you the numbers on the next slide. In fact, I'll go to the next slide and then come back. This is the number of people, 3,497, who did an ascorbate calibration. And then we show you how many of them calibrated on less than four grams, how many of them on five to 10 grams, all the way up to the, 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 the absolute peak. Some people needed more than 200 grams to flush or to calibrate. But let's look at this group of people that needed less than four grams. It's about 5% of this population. And I've already given you a cue or a clue, which is what percent of the ambulatory population in America is healthy? Anybody know? Less than there used to be, that I know. 3%, 5%, you can get numbers that are clearly in the single digits. Some people would say three, some people would say six, but the consensus is that really healthy asymptomatic people, about one in 20. Interestingly, this is how the data came out. We, we didn't know this is how the data would come out, but this data suggests that about 5% of the people calibrate on less than four grams of ascorbate, and we think that's a separate cohort. So this is the yellow color that we're seeing for the group that calibrates on less than four grams a day. Now let's move on. And here I showed you the numbers. What about the people who calibrate between five and 10 grams a day? 
not, not so bad. Let's say it took you 10 grams to calibrate. You could do that in an hour. Still not a huge amount of ascorbate. Well, that's only about 10% of the population. And we've labeled that the typical. You can also label that the ambulatory worried walking wounded. <laughs> Have you heard the term worried walking wounded? If you haven't, you should. In healthcare policy, we talk about the people who are well, we talk about the people who are sick, and then we talk about an intermediate group of ambulatory, and they're the, worrying walk, the worried walking wounded. Now, I can't say that three times fast, but the worried walking wounded are a different population, and maybe this is this group. We, we, we still have to do a lot more to understand this, but 10% of the people appear to calibrate between 5 and 10 grams, based on this roughly 3,300, 3,400 people that we did. And that's an interesting cohort. What about the next group? Well, it turns out that 80% of people, 80%, 8 out of 10 people, will calibrate more than 10 and less than 130 grams. Can anyone tell me how many micrograms 130 grams is? A lot. 130 grams is 130,000 milligrams. It's 130 million micrograms. So if you think in terms of micrograms or milligrams, it's a lot. But I will point out later in the talk that ascorbate should be thought of as a bulk nutrient in the diet. It is actually not a vitamin. One of the big mistakes we made, and since Georgie himself pointed this out, was to call ascorbate a vitamin. It is not a vital amine. It does not activate an enzyme. It actually is not a vitamin, it is a substrate that protects and that allows the body to do many beneficial things. 80% of this population calibrated between 10 and 130 grams. So that's a very wide range. More than 10, less than 130 grams. And then there's another cohort, this population out here, and they calibrated at more than 130 grams, about 5% of people. And we've labeled them the canaries, the canaries in the mine. These are the people who have a very short half-life. These are the people who can use up half of their ascorbate in half an hour. And they need a lot to achieve the same tissue, plasma, cellular level. So the takeaway message is that the amount of ascorbate you need varies widely with the individual. Fortunately, there's an ascorbate calibration protocol that you can use to find out how much ascorbate you need. And if you would let me know, how many of you are familiar with and or have used the ascorbate calibration protocol? A few. Please tell your friends. From the perk.org website, perque.org, or perk.com website, you can download the ascorbate calibration protocol. These are the details of how to take ascorbate in graded amounts so that within a few hours you can find out how much ascorbate you need. So when people ask me how much ascorbate do they need, I tell them how they can find out for themselves. So this is a self-test to determine how much ascorbate you need, actually based on the half-life, but determining that functionally and physiologically. The website is perque, that's the name of the company, perque.org, O-R-G, or .com, two companion websites, perk.org for nutrition information, perk.com for product information. Um, and uh, what we think we have seen is that there seem to be four different populations that you can uh, define if you get enough people to do ascorbate calibrations. And then how to do that uh, is downloadable. Uh, be happy to talk with any of you about that. So there's no nutrient that has a wider range than ascorbate. There's nothing that uh, requires such a dynamic range. And the reason is because ascorbate does lots of different things, only one of which is to mobilize and excrete toxic minerals. Thus far, I've tried to convey to you that toxic minerals are recirculating in the body and they can be chaperoned and safely removed with ascorbate binding up the divalent cation with the vicinal hydroxyls and chaperoning or 
uh, safely transiting the toxic metal out of the body without redepositing it, say, at the loop of Henle or at the blood-brain barrier or at the choroid plexus, uh, and without the pro-oxidant effects that you would have if the ascorbate wasn't protecting it. Now we're going to move on to ask about synergists. What are the things that work with ascorbate to increase its effectiveness in mobilizing toxic metals? And this is magnesium, zinc, a healthier alkaline state, sulfur sources, and selenomethionine. And we'll be talking about each of these in, in, uh, in sequence, but the introduction for this section is that buffering minerals like magnesium and zinc, an alkaline state in general, which means foods that are alkaline forming in the body, and sulfur sources, certain classic detoxifying foods, and selenomethionine, each in their way can help with ascorbate, can amplify the benefits of ascorbate in safely mobilizing and removing toxic metals. Now let's look at that in more detail. You can displace the toxic metal with buffering minerals like magnesium, zinc, and alkaline foods. You can complex the toxic metal with sulfur sources and selenomethionine. We recommend doing both. You want to alkalinize the body so that uh, first thing in the morning, the body shows a healthy alkaline pH range in the urine as a reflection of the overall systemic effects after rest. And you want to be able to complex toxic metals if they are anywhere in the fluid phase, in the plasma, in the lymph fluid, in the spinal fluid. Uh, toxic metals can be bound to sulfur uh, compounds and selenomethionine and safely removed uh, it has a synergistic effect with ascorbate. Separate mechanism of action, synergistic with ascorbate. So the synergist can displace. This is an ionic effect. If you've got, say, mercury or nickel or cadmium in the DNA or in the histone proteins or it's in the mitochondria or it's in some place it shouldn't be, we think the first thing to do is to alkalinize, bring in healthy minerals like magnesium and zinc, alkaline-forming foods, we have a chart of food effects on body chemistry. This is also downloadable from the website. So you can select 80% of the foods that you eat should be alkaline forming if you're trying to optimize your alkaline reserves, 60% uh, for maintenance. Again, this is downloadable and in detail. And then you would want to complex or conjugate to sulfur sources and selenomethionine if you could uh, to help work along with the ascorbate to remove the toxic metals. So with regard to the uh, buffering effects, we want to increase magnesium, zinc, and alkaline foods to displace. We want to uh, reflect this in the first morning urine pH. How do you know if you have enough buffering minerals? How do you know if you have enough alkaline foods? Well, you check first thing in the morning. You have in your pocket, almost all the time, pH paper. I'll show you this in a slide in a few minutes. This I give out as a party favor if anyone is interested. And if you have this in your pocket, you can take it out in the morning because you have it with you, which means you can take it out in the morning. And I actually stand up and I hold the strip in front of me. And if it wiggles, then I worry about a tremor, but it doesn't. And then I pee on it. So it's a target practice. And I have a little fun with this. You don't have to do it that way. You can pee in a cup if you want and then dip it in if you're more proper. I understand Republicans dip and Democrats uh, 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 pee directly. I don't know if that's true. You have to ask John if that's true. So uh, I do know that laughing is good for your endorphins. That I know. So we can displace the toxic minerals and then make ascorbate more effective at removing them. We can reflect this in the first morning urine pH. The target or goal state is 6.5 to 7.5. If you have enough buffering minerals that you're still a little alkaline in the morning, that's excellent. If you have a little net acid excess and you put that in the urine, that's fine. But if you show too much net acid excess, then you're in deficit about these essential buffering minerals that activate the enzymes. If the cell's too acidic, it doesn't work very well. It gets unhappy. And the uh, perk.org website uh, is the source for the alkaline way. There's a booklet on the alkaline way. There's the chart on food effects on body chemistry, as well as the information on the ascorbate calibration. Ah, the picture of this little pH strip. How convenient. The reason that we recommend a range of 5.5 to 8 is because you want to be able to discriminate between small gradations of change in acidity. So we use a 5.5 to 8 range on the pH paper. Check first thing in the morning after six hours of rest. 
After six hours of rest, the urine is equilibrated in the bladder with the cells, and so you're getting a measure of cellular acid status or acid alkaline balance. During the day, there are about 50 different variables that influence urinary pH. And unless you know all those 50 variables, you can't draw any conclusions. But after rest, first in the morning, your pH in the urine is equilibrated with the cells, and therefore it's a measure of net acid excess. Sue Whiting thought that you needed to do 24-hour urine collections under oil in order to get accurate net acid excess measurements. She's technically correct. She took this on as a challenge to disprove us. What she proved was that the first morning urine correlates exquisitely, our value better than 0.95, with the total 24-hour net acid excretion. Keep a daily health log. We recommend that people do this. Very often, if you have your clients do this, they'll bring the information into you and they'll say, when I'm more alkaline, I feel better. When I'm more acidic, I'm more symptomatic. When I'm more alkaline, I'm more helpful. hopeful. When I'm more acidic, I'm more helpless and hopeless. When the person makes that discovery and you can reinforce the truth of biology within their discovery, it's much more meaningful than when you show them a chart or a graph or even a hundred cases of other people. So we encourage you to use these tools to make personal assessments that drive home how much this relates to the individual, improves their compliance and their bond with your practice. The physiological healthy pH range is small. The healthy est range is even narrower. So the usual range is out here. The healthy range is in here. We'd like you to know both. This is a document that we have on the websites in regard to the alkaline way. This is to show you that I'm the guy who has to do with this. This is the healthy range, 6.5 to 7.5. If you have net acid excess, it wears you out. This is chronic disease, degenerative disease, autoimmune disease. If you have a higher than healthy pH, you could be in a catabolic illness state due to surgery or some other kinds of traumas. Neither of those is healthy. It's the middle ground that's healthy. Here is a little bit of chemistry. We have a scale that actually starts at zero and goes to 12, but the physiological range is from four to eight. The more acidic you are, the sicker you are, the more alkaline you are, the healthier you are within this range. Venous pH is kept tightly controlled. Arterial pH is kept tightly controlled, slightly more alkaline. Why do we keep such an exquisite pH control on the plasma? Because the body works very well in a very narrow pH range. And even a little bit of acidosis. Remember ketoacidosis in diabetics is very bad for them? Everybody remember that? Well, a little bit of acidosis is like a little bit of ketoacidosis. If you're not in frank ketoacidosis, you could still be acidic and at risk. That's the point I'm trying to make. We want to be in the physiologically healthier alkaline zone. We don't want to be too acidic. We don't want to be too alkaline. We want to be in the healthy range. Now that we can use these as tools rather than just as artifacts of the laboratory, we think that's more helpful. Well, now let's go on to these synergists and talk about those that complex, those that conjugate the toxic metals. These are the Thrive With Five, Thrive With Five high sulfur foods. Thrive With Five garlic, onions, ginger, eggs, and brassica sprouts. You don't need all of them. You do need one or more in the di daily diet as a staple of the diet if you want to have the sulfur foods that complex and conjugate the toxic metals. Because the best place to get the toxic metals is before they get you. So the high sulfur foods, garlic, onions, ginger, eggs, and brassica sprouts are recommended. We also recommend selenomethionine. Selenomethionine is nature's toxic metal trap. It's the only form of selenium that does this. And if any of you have friends who are tuna fish, and you are concerned about their mercury levels, check with them and they'll tell you that their selenomethionine levels are five to ten times higher now than they used to be before the people put the mercury in the ocean. So the tuna fish have figured out how to complex the mercury with selenomethionine. It does keep it in the, t in the fish, but it dramatically reduces the toxicity. And the way I first became concerned about that is if you measure the mercury levels in the fish, they shouldn't be able to navigate. 
the levels of mercury are high enough that their coordination system shouldn't work well, but they seem to navigate, which means the fish have figured out something before us. And what they figured out was that if you raise your selenomethionine, you can complex with the toxic metals. And the tuna fish didn't publish this in Science Magazine, but it was published in Science Magazine about two years ago. So those of you who want to look at the primary evidence, please take a look at it there. So you want to use the high sulfur foods, garlic, onions, ginger, eggs, and brassica sprouts. You want to use selenomethionine. It's the only form of selenium that works for this purpose of complexing. With regard to selenomethionine, selenium interacts and has helpful implications. This is a Laura Raymond and colleagues article. Came out of USDA, University of North Dakota, Grand Forks. It was published in the Seychelles Medical and Dental Journal. Now I know you all get that and have read that often. But in case you missed this article, you can go back to it. Does anyone associate with Seychelles with anything? The Seychelles Island study? What? Mercury because of consumption in the fish. And remember there were two big studies. One that showed a positive effect and one that showed a negative effect. Welcome to science. Not the subject for today. So we want to use those sulfur sources that often get depleted. Do you know that most Americans have a deficiency of garlic, onions, ginger, brassica, sprouts, and eggs? They do. Why do I say that? Because if you do look, as we have, all over the world for healthy populations, pockets of people that live a long life an enjoyable life, generally a low disease state, high quality of life, every one of them takes in one or more of those five sulfur foods every day. It's a staple of the diet. You don't need all of them. You do need one or more of them on a daily basis. Thomas Jefferson recommended this. So did Hippocrates. So did Galen. So did Semmelweis. Remember him? He wanted you to wash your hands. But he also recommended high sulfur foods. And up to the modern times, people have rediscovered and rediscovered the basic truth that biology gives us the way of balancing out the toxins. If we choose to not use nature's toxin traps, then we pay the price. So selenomethionine is, uh, if selenomethionine is low, it impairs vitamin E membrane protection from oxidative stress. So you can take all the vitamins E you want, but vitamins E only become active when they have selenomethionine with them. So is everyone aware that vitamin E selenomethionine is the protective membrane antioxidant? Not just vitamin E, not just selenomethionine, it's the complex that protects the membrane. So if you've given people a lot of vitamin E, but they've still had oxidative stress progression in their cardiovascular disease or in other diseases, it's because they lack selenomethionine. So don't forget selenomethionine. It's not a very uh, um, dramatic molecule. It doesn't get up and say, look at me, look at me. But selenomethionine is the complement, the essential activator of vitamins E, and you want to have the selenomethionine form to protect the membranes to pick up the free radical, that's the electron that can be transferred to the ascorbate. That same electron gets transferred all the way down the chain into the mitochondria. It's the same electron that we extract ATP for beneficial work from. So there's a, a whole sequence of events that are benefited when you have these sulfur sources. When we deplete the sulfur sources from the diet, then glutathione becomes depleted. Because glutathione is a sulfur-containing tripeptide. You need to have glutamine, you need to have cysteine, a sulfur amino acid that comes from these sulfur foods in order to make glutathione. And the glutathione will run down if you don't have enough sulfur foods in the diet or if you have more toxic oxidative stress that requires more of these sulfur foods in the diet. So we now get to protection. And it turns out that every one of us, as part of our birthright, has a circulating molecule, a family of molecules, called metallothionines. And metallothionines' job 
is to go around like a sponge looking for toxic metals. And if the metallothionine finds a toxic metal in your plasma, in your blood, in your spinal fluid, in your lymphatics, in your cells, in your stool, there are different metallothionines in different parts of the body. They all have the job of protecting you from toxic metals. Let me say that differently. Only when selenomethionine and these metallothionines are low do toxic metals accumulate in the human body. Has anyone thought about why it is that today so many more people seem susceptible to relatively low levels of mercury and toxic metals? Are any of you old enough to remember when we would roll mercury around in our hands, play with it, dip quarters in it, make them shiny? You do, okay? Some of us are that old. Those of us who did that are still in the room. How come we didn't keel over? The amount of mercury that we used to throw up in the air and watch it disappear, if you drop that in a school today, they call people in bunny suits, they close the school for two weeks, they get hysterical, the newspapers come, oh my God, they found a drop of mercury. Now, you shouldn't have liquid mercury running around. I don't recommend doing this at home. But metallothionines have changed in the last 35 years from the point where almost everybody had plenty to the point where now only 5 to 10 percent of the population is making adequate amounts of metallothionine. So teleologically, <clears throat> teleologically, we are opening the door to the toxic metals, we are seeing the consequences, and we seem surprised. That's the teleological explanation. So these metallothionines are polypeptides, they're made of glycine and cysteine. The cysteine is a sulfur amino acid. It has magnesium and zinc on the surface. So you have a polypeptide with glycine and cysteine. You have magnesium and zinc on the surface of the peptide. Toxic minerals displace those minerals. The magnesium and zinc becomes available to the cells. That's good. The toxic metals are conjugated to the sulfur and excreted. Selenomethionine does the same, but for the membrane, works with vitamin E to protect and defend. So, only when metallothionines and alkaline mineral reserves are depleted first does toxic mineral increase the, in uptake. To me, this helps explain why people seem to be more vulnerable to toxic metal bioaccumulation and effects than they used to be. Why? Because we're eating a more acid-forming diet, a more processed diet, a diet lower in sulfur-rich foods, lower in buffering minerals, lower in selenomethionine, lower in all of those protective forms. So it's like there's a hurricane going on outside. Not to be, I shouldn't mention such things. <laughs> it's not, by the way, tomorrow, not today. <laughs> and hopefully it'll go somewhere else. But it's like there's a hurricane outside and people are going out without their galoshes and, and, and without a raincoat and without a, an umbrella. The umbrella is like the metallothionine. The raincoat is like the selenomethionine. The galoshes are like the ascorbate. If it was really raining hard outside and someone went out without an umbrella, without galoshes, without a raincoat, you'd say, gee, that's foolish. Well, that's kind of what we're doing by analogy. Now, I'll talk for a moment about magnesium. Metabolic acidosis underlies chronic disease. Can we get agreement on that, that metabolic acidosis underlies chronic disease? Metabolic acidosis means buffering mineral deficiency. Metabolic acidosis means the good minerals like potassium and magnesium, but also like calcium and zinc, have run down, leaving behind an acid excess. This was in JBC, Journal of Biological Chemistry in the year 2000, pointing out that toxic minerals are 100 to 1,000 times more toxic if you're acidic and lack magnesium. And they're correspondingly less toxic if you're alkaline and have enough magnesium. So when someone says, is there any scientific evidence to support this, you can point them to the Journal of Biological Chemistry and other similar articles. They, they do exist. They're hard to find. That's part of why uh, I have the privilege of presenting this. And it, really is a, a pleasure to be here. In this JBC article, they point out that mitochondrial toxic mineral, which means relative calcium excess and magnesium deficit, so mitochondrial toxic mineral excess and, and calcium excess 
are definitively associated with retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic neuropathy, myofascial pain, probably associated with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, progressive autoimmune disease, free radical vascular disease, and repair deficit inflammation like arteriosclerotic heart disease and coronary artery disease. Really? JBC? Yes. Good, solid, basic science that happens to have clinical implications. But if you want to read the basic science, you've got to go to the basic science literature. If you want to read the clinical literature, you go to the clinical literature. Buried in the basic science literature are often very important clinically relevant articles. Another subject for another time. Now what about ascorbate compared to glutathione? You've probably heard about glutathione as beneficial, and it is. Ascorbate has a reducing potential that's independent of concentration. That's beneficial for ascorbate. Glutathione is concentration dependent. When glutathione runs down, it stops protecting the cells. Ascorbate tries and continues to protect the cell with redox potential until it's severely depleted. A stress cell will increase the uptake of dehydroascorbate. Don't confuse this with a fatty acid. Dehydroascorbate by facilitated diffusion from inner and outer sources, oxidative stress in contrast, exports the oxidized glutathione and the glutathione complexes that ATP is dependent upon. Ascorbate and dehydroascorbate are imported into the cell. The DHA is reduced back to ascorbate and it's active. Glutathione is not imported into cells. Glutathione is not imported into cells. Did I say that glutathione was not imported into cells? It's not. It is synthesized or regenerated inside the cell. So when you try to give external glutathione, you may do beneficial things, but you're not raising the cellular glutathione level. Why? Because somebody just said that glutathione is not imported into cells. <laughs> Thank you. A few, more, a few more facts. Red cells and other cells store ascorbate 30-fold over plasma. So if you have one milligram per deciliter ascorbate in the plasma, you'll have 30 milligrams per deciliter in the metabolically active tissues. And this 30-fold concentration continues all the way up to the level at which ascorbate precipitates physically in the cell. There's no other compound that has no plateau. Every compound in biology increases to a certain point, and if you have more of it, it just plateaus. Not ascorbate. Ascorbate increases uptake into the cell up to the point where you can actually watch with a confocal microscope the ascorbate precipitating in the cell. It's about five millimolar, hugely high concentration for physiological purposes. Ascorbate is increased by oral intake, individualized by calibration as we talked about. Dehydroascorbate can generate glucose and can increase NADPH for glutathione production and for anabolic beneficial pathways. These are some of the benefits of ascorbate. In contrast, glutathione is not stored. It's hard to increase glutathione from oral sources, and there are potential problems with gut dysbiosis. That's an issue. Recycling of glutathione complex is a multi-step process. It consumes ATP. It's energy requiring. Um, and while it's important to be able to recycle the glutathione, it is something that diminishes rather than enhances the cell's energetic capacities. The takeaway is that ascorbate is the friend of glutathione. And if you like glutathione, you should raise ascorbate in order to indirectly raise glutathione. So ascorbate is regenerated in mitochondria by three pathways, and that an exogenous ascorbate intake is facilitated by diffusion. Glutathione is only generated in the cytoplasm, and it's transported into the mitochondria. Two molecules of ATP are needed for each molecule of glutathione formed, so you use up ATP, it's energy requiring and two more are needed for its degradation. It costs cell energy. So glutathione does a lot of good things, but it also costs cell energy. If you're someone with chronic fatigue, you would want to raise the ascorbate to raise the ATP and indirectly raise the glutathione. If you just try to raise the glutathione, say by infusion, you will deplete the ATP, not a beneficial outcome. So ascorbate and glutathione mutually spare each other in reactions with intracellular reactive oxygen species. They are linked in biochemistry, so regeneration of glutathione or ascorbate is efficient, reciprocal, and it predicts an increase in ascorbate that spares glutathione and to some extent vice versa. This is a slide to show you the reactive oxygen species and how ascorbate recycles 
to the DHA and how glutathione is linked in the regeneration, but it goes both ways. So ascorbate can sacrifice itself to preserve glutathione, and it does that. Glutathione, in turn, if it's oxidized, can come back to the reduced state by ascorbate sacrificing itself, and then these things recycle and recycle. That's the nice part about ascorbate, when the cell is alkaline and things are working well. With regard to mitochondrial uptake and ascorbate recycling, the conclusion is that ascorbate is present in the intermembrane space and in the cytochrome matrix. Recycle of dehydroascorbate and ascorbate free radical occurs by multiple pathways. More sensitive to oxidant stress than glutathione, yes, and ascorbate is the maternal or sacrificial molecule. Uh, Lee and colleagues uh, pointed this out in the Journal of Archives of Biochemistry and Biophysics in 2001. Ascorbate is willing to sacrifice itself so that the cell may survive. That's part of why we become so depleted in ascorbate, because ascorbate is willing to sacrifice itself. So ascorbate in the mitochondria in healthy people is already in millimolar range. Ascorbate is oxidized by reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, by superoxide or by peroxide if they form. And ascorbate takes the hit first, glutathione and thiols and vitamin E later. Superoxide can react with nitric oxide and react with nitric oxide to form the more dangerous peroxynitrite that ascorbate and uniquely ascorbate can effectively reduce and detoxify. So nitric oxide, which is important locally in a lot of biochemical reactions, if you're in an oxidative stress state, can convert to peroxynitrite, which is bad for you. And ascorbate comes by and says, peroxynitrite, you're bad. I'm going to reduce you to something non-toxic and get rid of you. So the ascorbate sacrifices itself to the benefit of the cell. A clinical aside, this is a 45-month-old girl with 5-hydroxyproluria. It's an inborn error of metabolism. She had hemolysis, glutathione depletion, caused by deficiency of glutathione synthetase, and she was followed before and after treatment with ascorbate or N-acetylcysteine, often given to raise sulfur pools and glutathione. And what they found was that high-dose ascorbate or NAC, given for one to two weeks, neither had obvious adverse or deleterious side effects. The ascorbate, however, increased lymphocyte ascorbate levels, uh, sorry, uh, uh, increased lymphocyte glutathione, wait a minute, yeah, yeah. Ascorbate increased the lymphocyte fourfold and the plasma eightfold in regard to glutathione. So if you had trouble understanding that, so did I and I wrote it. Ascorbate increases lymphocyte glutathione fourfold and it, inf it increases plasma glutathione eightfold. So ascorbate raises glutathione levels. NAC did the same but less effectively. So NAC increased lymphocyte glutathione levels three and a half fold and increased plasma levels six fold. So that was beneficial, but not as beneficial as the ascorbate. And if you look on a cost per gram basis, ascorbate is less expensive. So you have something that may be more beneficial and have multiple other benefits and less expensive. That's the point of the takeaway. That's Jane and colleagues' work uh, from the journal Pediatrics in 1994. So glutathione and ascorbate levels negatively correlate, they're inversely correlated, with oxidative DNA damage. The intracellular antioxidants, glutathione and ascorbate, and two molecular markers of oxidative DNA damage, this one and that one, were measured in lymphocytes from 105 healthy volunteers. A healthy volunteer is defined as a medical student, a technician, anyone who walked by the door and didn't have the problem, they put out their arm, okay, that's how you get the healthy volunteers. Those who don't run away. Endpoints of the study reveal that naturally occurring levels of intracellular antioxidant is negatively correlated to the level of oxidative damage. In other words, if you have more antioxidants, you're protected from oxidative damage. If you have less antioxidants, you're at risk. The results strongly suggest that intracellular glutathione and ascorbate protect human lymphocytes against oxidative DNA damage. 
So everyone who is in favor of oxidative damage to the DNA, please go in the next room. If you're not in favor of oxidative damage to your DNA, please be aware that ascorbate directly and by raising glutathione is helpful in protecting from damage, oxidative damage to the DNA. Here's some of the data. The plasma ascorbate was linearly associated with the lymphocytes. On ascorbate, the lymphocyte levels rose 51% from 16.7 plus or minus 4.9 to 25.3 plus or minus 6.9. It's not that I memorized it. I can see it on my computer here. Changes in the lymphocyte ascorbate after supplementation are associated with changes in the lymphocyte glutathione, highly significant in a statistical sense, and suggests that every one millimeter, mil, millimole, one molar change, every millimolar change in ascorbate changes the glutathione by a half a mole. So when you raise ascorbate, you raise glutathione, and if you look at the moles of ascorbate that get in, they raise the glutathione by about half again. So the conclusion is that ascorbate supplement increases glutathione in human lymphocytes. That's Lenten and colleagues' journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So Alton Meister, the chairman of biochemistry at Cornell for many years, was right all along. He pointed out way back when that ascorbate increases glutathione more effectively than anything else, even glutathione itself. And his conclusion, recently updated by Lenton and colleagues, is that ascorbate raises glutathione in human plasma and lymphocytes better than anything else. So that's the takeaway. What about the clinical applications? We have just a few minutes. Well, can ascorbate individual needs? What if you take in the amounts of ascorbate to calibrate? Ascorbate can cause significant abdominal discomfort, bloating, and gas. You can instruct the patient to stop if they're uncomfortable, and you can see the ascorbate calibration handout for digestive aids. If you just use ascorbate to find out how much ascorbate people need, and they're deficient in magnesium, they're deficient in glutamine, they're deficient in prebiotics and probiotics, what you will prove is that they're deficient in magnesium, that they're deficient in pre and probiotics, that they're deficient in sulfur sources, and so forth. And they're the ones who will come back and say, I didn't feel good. It wasn't the ascorbate. It was that the ascorbate brought out their deficiency in glutamine to energize and repair the gut, in pre and probiotics for healthy gut transit and assimilation and elimination. So in the ascorbate calibration, you will find information about more than ascorbate. And complex cases, complex individuals need to be alkalinized. They need to have the factors that work along with ascorbate in order to get the safe and effective results that we typically see. So you can calculate the total dosage to flush and multiply by three-fourths or 75% to determine the daily dose, typically given in a QID or four times a day protocol. Let's say it takes 10 grams to flush. Three quarters of 10 grams is seven and a half. Check the math. So seven and a half grams through the day is what you need. You could take that by, say, taking a little less than four grams in the morning and four grams in the evening, and that's fine. What if you needed 40 grams to flush? Now you need 30 grams, three quarters of 40 grams through the day. If you need more than 10 grams through the day, my suggestion is get a quart of water, put it in a jogger's bottle, put the amount of ascorbate for the day, let's say that's 30 grams, in the quart of liquid and sip on it. If you drink all of it before breakfast, you will probably flush again. I don't recommend the daily flush. I don't. But if you sip it through the day, you'll maintain the highest blood cellular levels of ascorbate, and the ascorbate will do as much for you as possible. So with regard to ascorbate calibration, you have the option of starting with gradually increasing QID doses if the patient is hesitant or has irritable bowel syndrome or just lacks trust. And I can tell you that I've had surgeons call me up and say the patient with ulcerative colitis is scheduled for surgery on Tuesday. What can you do in the next 20 minutes? And in some cases, the patient will tell you that they and their colon are now getting along just fine. We prefer to have more than 20 minutes before surgery, however, to do these things. The mechanism is a bit complex. I've tried to point that out. It is not seen in IV therapy. It's not an osmotic effect. 
You can infuse 100 grams of ascorbate by vein over two hours and you will not get a calibration flush, even in people who on 10 or 20 grams orally will flush. The mechanism for that is complex and I can talk to you about it on the side, but we think we understand why that is. Another anomaly. People have suggested that maybe this ascorbate calibration is just about osmotic effects. You know, you put in the vitamin C at the top and it wor works like a roto-rooter to get through to you. Well, there are people who will flush in less than an hour. If you pour something in the mouth, do you think one hour later it'll come out the tush? You hope not. If it does, you have a really short transit time. And some very serious problems that we should talk about. So if you give hypertonic or isosmotic or hypotonic ascorbate, the same amount induces the flush, so it's not an osmotic effect. What happens is the ascorbate gets absorbed, it saturates the body systemically, it then goes to the rectum, and it pumps extra fluid and toxins into the rectum, and you have an evacuation or a flush as if you'd given yourself an enema from within. It's a very distinctive endpoint. It's not loose stool. This is not bowel tolerance. This solves the problem of bowel tolerance. People used to creep up on the amount of ascorbate they needed. Bob Cathcart and others used to recommend this. The problem was as you got near the amount to calibrate or near the amount that you needed, you would often have a very uncomfortable feeling in your gut. That was the bowel tolerance method. We developed this kind of rapid ascorbate calibration flush so that the toxins do not recirculate in the body. So that when you do the ascorbate calibration, you flush the toxins out before they cause agina and discomfort. Now Jaffe, whoever he is, postulates that this is active and safer excretion of the toxins. There's no danger of rebound, but it is best to taper down. You can see the details in the handout on ascorbate calibration uh, if, if you are interested. So let's bring this into some perspective. Calibrated ascorbate meets the individual need. It's important because it sets the cell redox potential, the electrical vitality of the cell. It protects and recycles. It traps free radicals. It mothers ATP. And you know, if you study ATP and you understand that, then we'll teach you about AQP. Whenever you reach some understanding, there's something more we'll, we'll have to confuse you about at a higher level. This is. Uh, this is, instead of triphosphate, this is quatrophosphate, a very highly energetic molecule. Or phosphoenopyruvate. This is not just for soccer games. Uh, phosphoenopyruvate is another high energy compound that can be a store for work of the body. So tocopherols to protect the membrane, and what do we need with the tocopherols? Selenomethionine. Glutathione to protect the cytosol, but what do we need to protect both tocopherols and glutathione? Ascorbate, thank you. Taurine to protect the transport system, that's regenerated and recycled by ascorbate. Lipoic acid to protect the nucleus, recycled best by ascorbate. So if you want lipoate and taurine and glutathione to be at their best, then alkalinize the person and calibrate the ascorbate. And I'll even learn how to spell lipoic acid next time. Uh, if you're a healthy person and you want to see the uh, calibration, you do one and a half grams, which is a half a teaspoon. In two to eight doses, 90% of people will calibrate. And this healthy population, remember, is only about one in 20 people. If you're feeling poorly, you're that ambulatory, walking, worried, wounded group. You'd start at one teaspoon, which is three grams. You do that every 15 minutes. And in two doses, which is a half an hour, or 10 doses, which is two and a half hours, 90% of people will calibrate. So in this population, nine out of 10 people will calibrate within two and a half hours, and this population represents 80% of all people. And if you're chronically ill, you know, like it's gonna take you all day to flush. There are people, when we started this out, we said, gee, just do a gram and a half every 15 minutes until you flush. And some people very dutifully did a gram and a half, a half a teaspoon every 15 minutes for 12 hours an entire day. And then they would call me up, or their doctor would call me up and said, it took an entire day. I said, that can't be right. And what we discovered to our surprise was that some people needed an awful lot of ascorbate to calibrate. And so if you're in that population, 
that is chronically ill and therefore likely to need a lot of ascorbate, you might want to start with 6 grams, which is 2 teaspoons, in 2 to 10 doses, 75% of this population will calibrate. That's 15% of all people. But notice that everybody doesn't follow the rule. Every once in a while you'll have a difficult case or something that doesn't follow the rule. That's why we have the detailed notes on the calibration protocol. And if you really do get into a complex situation, I'm just waiting for your call. I'll share with you whatever experience we have, and we'll all learn and, and benefit from it. So the takeaway is that all cells have a 30-fold increase over plasma if they're metabolically active for ascorbate. The amount you need is based on the half-life. If you use it up quickly, you need more. If you use it up slowly, you need less. Prooxidants induce free radicals that damage cell structures and age the cells. Antioxidants protect the cells. We're more in favor of protection than of oxidative damage. These are biological approaches to that end. So the antioxidant, the reduced ascorbate, is the free radical trap, or is it a prooxidant? Is it ascorbate free radical that's a free radical source? Just when you thought that vitamin C was okay, someone comes along and says, oh, under some conditions it's a prooxidant. So now you have to worry about what state is the vitamin C in Missouri, California, here, <laughs> who knows? We worried about that a lot, and we found out that the test tube is different than the patient. This took a long time to figure out. So let's look at Joel Simon and Esther Hudis' work. Their conclusion is that high serum levels of ascorbate are independently associated with a decreased prevalence of elevated blood lead levels. If these associations, uh, associations are related causally, ascorbic acid intake may have public health implications for control of lead toxicity politely said. Let's look at Earl Dawson's work. Their conclusion is that daily supplementation of 1,000 milligrams of ascorbic acid results in significant decrease of blood lead levels associated with the general population. Ascorbic acid supplementation may provide an economical and convenient method of reducing blood lead levels, possibly by reducing the intestinal absorption of lead. Another article, extensive exercise might promote formation of reactive oxygen species and contribute to tissue damage. Thus, ascorbate levels in plasma were assessed by a very uh, complex technique, electron paramagnetic resonance, EPR, that looks for traces of prooxidant reaction. What were the results of this study? Vitamin C radical levels remained stable during the whole period. Neither vitamin E supplementation nor exercise had any influence on plasma concentration of vitamin C radical. The conclusion, vitamin E supplementation under conditions of mild oxidative stress, this is like running two miles, does not result in increased vitamin C radical concentration. There's no prooxidant action. Bruce Ames and Balls Fry re reviewed the world literature on ascorbate and they concluded that it's the safer and most versatile water-soluble antioxidant. This means that adequate ascorbate can protect, directly or indirectly, every part of the cell and organ system from free radical damage. One of the articles that we've published in the Seminars of Integrative Medicine 2005 concludes that an essential element of health-promoting lifestyle is eating nutritious, healthy foods, yet food can be a source of exposure to toxins, and current food production methods can have negative effects on environment and consumers. We identified contaminants present in food and describe adverse health effects from exposure to specific contaminants. Recommendations for how exposure can be prevented or minimized are presented in the article, but also here today. So individualized antioxidant, here AO means antioxidant. Individualized antioxidant intake would be based on ascorbate calibration so that you know how much is needed for the individual now. You use ascorbate well and individually, everything else goes better. It's the life-giving molecule. That's what Albert St. Georgi uh, says. Now, Albert St. Georgi was the guy who isolated ascorbate from Hungarian paprika, as he used to say it. And they asked him why. And he said he was the only Hungarian who didn't like Hungarian paprika, and his wife used to cook with it, and he thought if he took it all out of the garden and measured it in the laboratory, his wife wouldn't be able to cook with it. 
He also, and this was the real insight, he also noticed that when paprika dries, it remains bright red which meant there had to be a reducing substance keeping the color bright. And that's really what he went after was the reducing substance. Here's his article from 1932, I believe, approximately, Chemical Nature of Vitamin C uh, by, uh, by St. Georgie and colleagues. And he pointed out that adequate amounts of vitamin C replace most sugar cravings. With regard to musculoskeletal pain, there we would say you need flavonoids and flavanols along with the ascorbate, and this is in the notes and you can look at it uh, at your leisure. For musculoskeletal pain with reactive dendritic cells, to reactivate the dendritic cells, we recommend four flavonoid and flavanol tabsules with each meal and before bed until they're comfortable for a week, then four twice daily for maintenance as needed. We want to keep oxidized cholesterol and oxidized LDL at zero. They should be prevented from forming. If you have enough tocotrienols and tocopherols, 400 to 3600 IU a day, and selenomethionine, then the selenomethionine can activate the tocopherols to keep the cholesterol and oxidized LDL to zero. There are some old chestnuts that I want to quickly dismiss, that oxalate will form kidney stones, or that B12 will be consumed by ascorbate, or that the Fenton reaction occurs. The answer is none of the above. Good hydration is the answer to kidney stones. Ascorbate saturates oxalate formation at about one gram. So if you take in one gram, 10 grams, or 100 grams, you'll make the same amount of oxalate. With regard to B12 consumption, there is a question in the test tube. There's no question in vivo. Years ago, we studied for 21 and 28 days uh, infusion solutions that contained B12 and ascorbate at high levels. We found no negative interaction between B12 and ascorbate, and th that has become kind of the gold standard for that information since. The Fenton reaction does occur in vitro in the test tube. It does not occur in the body. And the way I know that is that if people with hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis would get Fenton reactions from taking ascorbate, they'd get really sick. And if you read the monograph from the FDA on the treatment of hemosiderosis and hemochromatosis, the preferred treatment is ascorbate because ascorbate safely reduces the ferric iron to ferrous. The reduced divalent iron can be sensed and excreted safely by the body. So the problem with hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis is a lack of ascorbate leading to oxidation of the iron and retention of the oxidized iron. When you reduce the iron back to the ferrous divalent form, the body can sense it and excrete it. So the details are important. People need enough to fill their ascorbate needs and determine how much for them is required. Ascorbate without masking agents is better. A lot of products have masking agents so you won't know that the ascorbate is oxidized. We recommend all ascorbate BL form. That's nature's form, not DL, not synthetic. The product should say 100% L form, fully buffered and fully reduced. 100% L form, fully buffered, fully reduced. That's the good stuff. All L, fully buffered, fully reduced ascorbate. So in practice, these are some of the details. If you like homeostasis, look to this as a way of restoring homeostasis. And now some quotes. Albertson Georgie says that leaving the jungle, this is about two million years ago, leaving the jungle, we lost our ability to make ascorbate. Modern science and technology made it possible to live in full health outside the jungle, offering ascorbate for one and a half cents a gram. It's a little more expensive today. To take full advantage of this, ascorbate should be a household article like sugar or flour and be sold by the pound in supermarket rather than by pills, uh, in pills by the druggist. So since Georgie recommended if you have a sugar bowl on your table, you should have a bowl next to it with ascorbate. And every teaspoon of sugar you use, you should have a teaspoon of ascorbate to compensate for it. That was since Georgie. Linus Pauling says, the reason I spend time thinking about medical problems like vitamin C is that I believe we are going to solve the problems of finding out how to keep the world from being destroyed in nuclear war, and then it'll be worthwhile to think about making a world a better place for coming generations. Improving people's health by reducing suffering caused by hypoascorbemia to a little vitamin C, from which far too many in the world suffer unnecessarily, only a few enlightened people seem to be taking adequate levels of vitamin C. This was Linus Pauling and his friends. 
and therefore they are in the fortunate position of not suffering from a genetic disorder that we have learned to control that is vitamin C or ascorbate functional insufficiency. Now he did die at 96 of prostate cancer, so ascorbate wasn't the whole answer. The take home message is that you take care of your mitochondria and they will take care of you and vice versa. That nourishment is elegantly simple in concept, yet one often overlooks details at great cost. Many clinical conditions are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. If you keep the mitochondrial energy production foremost in your thoughts, both you and your patients will benefit. So together we can find a better way to mitigate, remediate, and prevent epidemics of chronic illness and lack of wellness that are related to mitochondrial dysfunction that themselves are related to too much of the bad toxic metals, too little of the good antioxidants like ascorbate. If you have any interest, uh, please look further uh, at uh, the websites or give us a call. We're just waiting for the call to help explain to you how to apply this well and often. Thank you.